Hi, I'm Hilary Victoria and welcome back to my Crime and Policing channel. In today's session, we are looking at the first of a number of national drivers that have created change in uh, policing, legislation, law, policies and practices in the UK. Now, we're going to look at a lot of different cases throughout this video um, stream. We're going to look at things from the Brixton riots all the way to, you know, things like um, the horrific murders of Sarah Payne and Claire Wood. Lots of different cases that have changed how we police now, how the whole criminal justice system operates and how we as a society can be a little bit safer. Now, it's horrific, but sometimes it takes cases like this for change to happen. And those people who campaign against the things that happen to save other people from harm. And it's because of the actions of these people. So those who selflessly campaign, put all their work and effort into making things better, that the world gets a little bit safer each time. The first one I'm going to talk about is the case of Claire Wood. Now, if you are a policing student or you are a police officer and you've passed through training already, you should know the name Claire Wood. Now, Claire Wood was, um, by her family's description, ge kind, gentle, really kind, um, a great mum, a wonderful daughter, just a great person all around, a really nice, gentle soul. Um, however, at 36 years old, Claire lost her life because somebody took that life from her. So she was brutally murdered by her ex-boyfriend, George Appleton, who she'd met on the internet. Now, she'd met him on a, a dating app. So dating apps are huge and they were huge back in 2007 when they met. And because, you know, if you're a parent like Claire was, or if you work a lot, you can find it quite difficult to meet people in real life. And Claire met um, George Appleton on the internet on one of these apps. They started dating in April 2007. So, you know, texting, dating and seeing how things go. But in October 2008, she called it quits after she found out he was being, um, well, of the infidelity he'd had online with other women. She was like, mm, that's that's not for me. That's just definitely not what I want. And she was frightened of him as well. So there was a, a letter that she'd written to him that was never actually, never received, um, which one of the newspapers picked up where she said that she was still scared of him and she didn't want that kind of thing around her young daughter, which is totally reasonable and acceptable. But he didn't like that. He didn't like the rejection. Now, it was Claire's father, actually, who campaigned after her death and changed how things work as we know it. Now, when he first met George Appleton, he didn't like him at all. He thought there's something around this guy I just don't like. I think he said it's something about this, his aura. He just did not warm to and neither did his son. So his son met her with um, this new partner and he was like, this is giving me bad vibes. This is not something about him I just don't like. So Claire disclosed to her family that he'd actually got a criminal record, George Appleton, and her father, Michael Brown, so the person who campaigned and changed the world as we know it, after her you know, tragic death, he was a prison officer and he's like, well, I can't be hanging about with ex-cons and things because he'd been in prison. Um, but Claire, as far as she was aware, it was for motoring offences. Now, as, as we know, if you're in the, you know, the criminal justice world, it's got to be pretty severe motoring offences to be put in prison for them. Um, but obviously she didn't know this kind of thing. What she really, really didn't know is actually why he'd been in prison because he'd withheld that information from her. That information had been withheld from the rest of the family too. But had she known why he'd been in prison, her family were 100% sure she would not have been in a relationship with him. Nor would they have accepted him as her partner. Not that they were over keen on him anyway. So what he'd actually been in prison for and his extensive criminal record was to do with violence against women and girls. So he'd been, um, you know, convicted of assaulting and being incredibly violent towards women. And had Claire known that, they were very confident that she would never have been with him in the first place or let him around her daughter, who she absolutely cherished and idolised. So... Something had to change. Something big had to change because clearly we cannot let this kind of thing happen. If these vulnerable people like Claire, who, you know, she's a single parent, um, she has a child, she's unaware that this man has this checkered history and we're opening her up to the internet and online dating. It's like 
sermon up on a silver platter to these kinds of people. Now, being a single parent, by the way, doesn't mean you're definitely going to be a victim of domestic abuse. Domestic abuse can happen to anybody. It doesn't matter what gender you are. It doesn't matter whether you are, you know, the most rich person in the UK or whether you are extremely working class. It doesn't matter who or what background you are from. Anybody can be a victim of domestic violence. There are certain things that make you vulnerable. So, um, you know, studies have shown that if you've been a victim of violence before, chances are you, because you're in that vulnerable space that people who are quite um, abusive can see that weakness in you and, and latch onto that and the cycle begins again. Um, domestic abusers are very clever. You get a lot of people who are like, oh, I'd never get in a relationship like that. Oh, no way, I don't know why they put up with it. You can't say that unless you've been in one. So being in a relationship with someone who is abusive, it's, it doesn't start off like that. It doesn't start off being abusive. You know, nine times out of 10, these are the most amazing people in the world. You feel proper lucky to be in a relationship with them. You're like, how did I get this amazing person? Look at me, I'm so excited. They love me so much. They accept everything about me. I mean, we've got so much in common, right? And they do things like that. So they'll be like, oh, what's your favorite film? You're like, I don't know, Aladdin. And they're like, oh, me too. We've got so much in common. You're just like me. And they start to mirror and match you. Um, they'll start what you call love bombing. So first of all, you'll be like, oh yeah, you know, they treat me like an absolute princess. They love me so much. They've never felt like about anyone before. It's only been two days, hello. Um, lots of things that um, they do to get you hooked, you know, and then gradually your confidence will start slipping away because they start picking at it. They'll start making your independence slip away. So you find yourself being dependent on this person and you actually start believing the things that they're telling you. And this is all part of that. If you might have heard of like coercive control and stuff as well, um, where you eventually become conditioned to accept the behaviour they're giving to you and that to believe that you are the bad person. You're the one that's clearly done something wrong for them to be acting like that. And it might be things like, um, they might even be, they might go and cheat on you, but it's your fault because you're not satisfying them at home uh, and things like that. It's honestly, it's an absolute minefield. So if you see people in these violent relationships, I don't want you to be thinking like, oh, you know, just the quick answer is don't get in relationships with violent people. It's not that easy. And if you're policing these, crimes and you're going to the same occurrences all the time you know they, they, there are studies showing that it can take up to like 35 times of these incidents happening before the victims want a change or before they accept a change because they've been conditioned to accept this behavior so it's really tricky so please always have empathy with your victims that you're dealing with try and guide them because one day they might just take you up on it okay that's my lecture to you over so let's continue our, our study on Claire Wood then. So Claire broke up with George Appleton um, in October 2008 because she's like, this is not happening. You've been, you cheated on me. I, I'm not happy at all. It's over. And he didn't accept that because his ego had clearly been um, tarnished. This control he's got over her has waned. He no longer can control Claire. Now, if someone is, a, you know, a controller, you're an abuser, they like having control of somebody. And they're at the most dangerous when that control stops. So it might be that when you're in the relationship, you think that's dangerous. Actually, it's when you pull yourself out of it, when it can be the most dangerous. Um, I think in the years, in the study I was reading, 2014, 2015, 81 murders of um, spouses. So um, husbands, ex-partners had killed their partners, wives, girlfriends or whatever after they've broken up with them. So it's very, very dangerous. And that's when, you know, uh, charities and stuff like that can help. And certainly your families, because once you break that chain and their control is gone, that's when they are more manic and they want the control back. How dare you remove your control? You know what I mean? It's, it's very, very unusual. Um, so anyway, they broke up and he started this campaign of abuse against her. So it elevated from the stuff, the red flags that she'd seen in the relationship. I mean, they were nothing. This guy got them red banners out now. He was harassing her, threatening to kill her. He'd attempted to rape her. 
She called the police on numerous occasions, by the way, and, you know, they have found some severe failings in the response towards this. Um, she got a panic alarm fitted in the house. This is big stuff, but she'd not told the parents the true extent of how bad it was, whether that's because she was a little bit ashamed or she thought, you know what, it'll bugger off eventually. It, it just needs to get over it or whatever. Um, but he didn't, obviously. So the police arrested him after he kicked a door in. Um, and it was a couple of days later that he actually murdered her. So this is when he's lost control and he's, he's clearly lost all sense of his own control as well. Um, he's kicked a door in. The police have come. They've arrested him. And then a few days later, she's dead. Now, in terms of how he... Um, how he killed her, it's typical of power and control as well, and the hedonistic type of thing. So a certain power and, and dominance over her to the end. He um he raped her, he strangled her, and he set her on fire. So this is absolute despicable behaviour, obviously. Um asserting that dominance over her and just completely she wrecked his ego and confidence, therefore that's what he did to her. Um, after that happened, he took his own life. He hung himself in a pub that had been derelict since the 1980s. And it was her ex-partner who'd found her in that um, state at her home on the um, pleas of her father to go and have a look for her because he'd not heard from her. And that's what they found. So obviously they were absolutely devastated. An understatement is devastated. And Claire's father, Michael Brown, was absolutely, you know, he started this campaign and one of the things he said he wasn't trying to crucify anybody he didn't want any of the parents to go through what he did because of this situation that happened he knew that his daughter would never have got involved with this man had she known the extent of his criminal background the family would never have let go anywhere near him they'd have he said he'd have marched her back home from where she lived himself had he known the background of this person so he campaigned and he campaigned and he campaigned saying that women and men, anybody, have a right to know if somebody they are dating or prospective dating has a criminal record in that type of crime. So violence against, you know, partners and things like that. They have a right to know, a right to ask these questions. You shouldn't, you shouldn't be made vulnerable to this kind of thing. Now, obviously, as you can imagine, the media at the time completely took hold of this case. They were like, it shook. I mean, it, it, one of the headlines said it shook Britain and it did because it's absolutely terrible. And you know what? It's not the only one either. So there are the cases we're going to look at that are as horrific and have also changed the law. But it's thanks to Michael Brown, Claire's father, that everything changed. And that's where Claire's law was, was born. So Claire's Law, officially known as the Domestic Violence Disclosure Scheme, came to life in 2014. Now this comes in quite nicely with all the changes we started to see developing in relation to domestic abuse in law. So prior to that, um, things like domestic abuse, um, things like coercive control, financial abuse and things like that weren't really counted. They were just looking at stuff like domestic violence. But since... 2014 onwards, we started recognising more forms of abuse. Unfortunately, anything prior to 2014 in terms of domestic abuse, you can't then um, retrospectively charge on. But from then on, you can start to consider these different things. Lots of things have come into place since um, or around this stuff. So something called DASH. So you, um, domestic abuse, stalking, and harassment and honour-based violence checklist that you'll go through every time you attend a domestic violence um incident you'll do a dash form with the victim and it's got a series of questions on and i think these are fantastic by the way um it'll ask you lots of different things about the whole household so it could be you might think why are you asking me about my pets why are you asking me if he keeps like weapons and things um because it all matters and these are the type of things they use to formulate these kind of profiles about the person they're looking at. If someone injures an animal, chances are, if you're looking at things like the power and control, elements of criminology, they're going to injure a person. These are the things that you look at to make that profile about that person. But Dash will be a different video entirely. 
What we're looking at now, however, is Claire's Law. So when that came in in 2014, it was amazing. And it's actually quite underutilised when it comes to policing. And it's quite simple to do. So you can call 101 in the UK and you can ask if you can do Claire's Law and they'll take your details. Someone will call you back to ask kind of like why, because it, it, you can't do it maliciously. It's got to be a genuine concern or a genuine, genuine reason why. So I've used Claire's Law before when I started a relationship with somebody. I didn't know much about this guy and I didn't want to like have anything like that in my life or around my child's life. So I called up and requested if I could do a Claire's Law thing and um, spoke to the police officer at the other side of Atlas Corp. They, that's the call centre. They asked me a number of questions about why, etc. Um, a detective came out to see me. In fact, there were two of them, they were double crewed, to go through some questions with me about why I wanted to do this. And then the results came back in, in so many days. Um, so it's very, very simple. It's underutilised and it's broken down into different parts. There's the right to know and there's the right to ask. So let's go through those now. So the right to ask is triggered by a member of the public um, requesting a disclosure. So when I called up to request that information, that's the right to ask. Now, it doesn't have to be the person that's in the relationship that can call up for the right to ask. It could be a family member or someone else who's a little bit concerned or has reservations about this person that's entered somebody else's life. So that's your right to ask. Now, they won't go through everything with you in terms of their criminal history, but if they think there's something on there that you need to know um, in relation to their relationship history and violence, etc., then they'll tell you. But they're not going to tell you every single thing that's on their record. So if someone, I don't know, wazzed up a bus stop when they were 19, they're not going to tell you that. They're going to tell you anything that's um, in relation to why you are asking. Because obviously people have the rights to their own private lives, as we know, if we're looking at... Um, the Human Rights Act, but also they've got a right to keep you safe as well. So um, in terms of the right to ask, you can ask the questions, they'll tell you anything relevant. There are three stages to that. So there's an initial request, the face-to-face -face meeting with police officers, then you'll have the risk assessment. After the risk assessment, it'll be referred to a multi-agency um, forum, and then they'll either disclose or they won't disclose, depending on, on what it is. But like I said, it's gotta be relevant they're not going to tell you about some murdering offences from 10 years ago, but they will tell you if it's anything relevant in order to keep your own personal safety. Now there's a right to know. The right to know is slightly different and that's triggered when the police um, make a proactive decision to disclose some information. Where a safeguarding agency comes into some information about violence um, from this one person to another and they now think that because of the history, this new person's at risk. So that could be a right to know where it triggers and the police decide to come disclose something to you. That goes through another kind of system. So like I mentioned, those stages for the right to ask, when it comes to right to know, that also goes to the multi-agency team and then that decision whether to disclose or not will, will come through there. So it's not just done willy-nilly. It's not just like, oh yeah, your phone up, you want to know about this boy, we'll tell you about him, what you want about his woman. Yeah, actually she's a bit of a, a you know, she did some shoplifting and all this kind of stuff. That's not how it happens. It's relevant stuff and it's got to be for legitimate purposes. So you can't just be gossiping about people or whatever. It's got to be legitimate and you will go through all these questions and stuff with the police officers you talk to so that you're not actually just being nosy about somebody you've got nothing to do with. The main thing about the domestic violence disclosure scheme is it's to keep people safe. It's not used as some spying tool to try and... Um, hurt people or to cause any further anguish to anybody else it's used to keep people safe now if you're in a relationship with somebody and you want to do this and they've got severe like you know um problems with you doing this kind of scheme then you've got to ask yourself why because surely if you've got no nothing on your record you're like yeah crack on fill your boots but if someone's got reservations as to why then you might want to start asking yourself some questions as well but this whole act, the Domestic Violence Disclosure Scheme, came into fruition because of Michael Brown, the father of Claire Wood. And if it wasn't for him and this, then this kind of service wouldn't be available for others. Now, like I said, it's underutilised. Definitely use it if you think you've got a legitimate and genuine reason to do so. Obviously, the police won't um, 
accept any malicious kind of nastiness. It's a tool to be used for good and to keep people safe. Like I said, there's a right to ask and the right to know. The right to ask is that process where you make initial contact, you have a face-to-face -face meeting, they'll do a risk assessment, which will go to the multi-agency partnership meeting, and then they'll decide whether to disclose stuff to you or not. Um, anything relevant, they will disclose to you. But that, like I said, is a bit of a risk assessment. So um, is it reasonable to give you that information? Is there a true necessity for you to know that? Will you be safe otherwise? You know, they go through all these different procedures to keep you safe. Again, with the right to know if the police trigger something or someone else safeguarding wise is triggered to let you know that something bad has happened here and it might affect your relationship, you might be in similar circumstances, then they will do that as well. That again, it will be the right to know that will go through the multi-agency then it'll be disclosed or it won't be disclosed. And that's how it works. So thank you to Michael Brown for campaigning. He's unfortunately passed away now, but before he did, obviously he changed the world as we know it. Unfortunately, at the um, tragic death of his beloved daughter, Claire Wood, and um, the horrific actions of George Appleton. So that is the case of Claire Wood, which, like I said, is a national driver for change. And that's where we get our domestic violence disclosure scheme from. OK, so next time we will be looking at some different cases. There are lots of us to choose from. But in the meantime, stay safe, look after each other and please don't commit any crimes.